right. Good morning, everyone. Turn to somebody right now and tell them the cross has the final word. It is great to see you. 2017, like Sandy said, we're a few weeks in. And ready or not, it is here. Are you ready to go? All right. I know it's early, so everybody just kind of shake it off like you get a boxer getting ready to go in the ring. Yeah, get your pen right now and your handout. And All right, I'm ready to get prepped. I'm ready to train. I'm ready to get equipped. And if you're here uh, watching us online today, we are so glad you're watching. We wish you were here, but I know a lot of people can't make it for various reasons. And uh, what a great crowd this morning. It's a little intimidating. I walked out of the office And uh, I was like, whoa, uh, where am I going to sit? But that's cool. We're so glad you're here. It's good to be close to each other, right? Turn to the person beside you right now and say, you are blessed to be sitting by me, by the way. I love that blessing. We give that. You're giving. You're taking advantage of that opportunity. Can we get real right from the get-go? Last week, we talked about, we started a little introduction to this message, and we had our missionaries uh, speak to us. So we're going to continue this message today about ready for obstacles. We talked, first of all, about opportunities, and God has given us an opportunity. This day is an opportunity, right? What are you going to do with it, man? What have you done with the first three weeks of 2017? And if you're kind of like me, you're going, man, I'm not hitting the workouts like I wanted to, or maybe I haven't treated people exactly like I wanted to. How many know God is a forgiving God, and he's ready to do something with you today forward that is exciting and I am ready to do that and I got to tell you there's nothing good I can give you today unless it comes from God and as I stand here and look at the honor and the privilege to speak to you on behalf of God that's a very very huge big deal to me and today I just say God help me to give people Jesus and so I hope that you receive Jesus today and what I know is we started a fast Uh, last week, and and we're going to talk about that today. If you've not jumped in yet, I encourage you to jump in. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But how many know when you get ready and you say, I'm going to do this for God, and you, you tighten up your bootstraps and you get your armor on, how many know the fight is coming? The obstacles are coming. We talked about last week, you know, I talked about, yeah, Clemson won the national championship. We don't want to talk about that anymore. And uh, so... Uh, it, 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 we talk about the fact that how Deshaun Watson's a great quarterback and a lot of people aspire to be great quarterbacks, but it's one thing to have even skills and be, say you're prepared. It's another thing to face a strong defense, and he did a great job of that. And like him overcoming the best defense in the country, you can overcome the most horrific obstacles in your life if Jesus is ahead of you, Right? you got to have Jesus, the power of Jesus today. And so we're going to talk about overcoming obstacles. It's amazing how I can preach it and teach it, but when you got to live it, you can do it. Thank you. Monday morning after Sunday, beautiful day. Kids have got the day off school, so I'm going to take my younger kids and Sandy's boys. They all wanted to go fishing. I'm like, this is a great opportunity. Take the morning off. Not going to tell the details of what happened that day, but let's just say the day started off with some obstacles. And it was, it was one of those obstacles you're going you're gonna to have to deal with for days, if not weeks, if not years, and, and not going into details. But man, I'm like, oh my Lord Jesus. You know, but how many know that's what happens? If you, as we're going to read in Hebrews, understand that the Lord disciplines those he loves... And discipline is not pleasant. Well, well, check it out. It's coming. I I, got to tell you today, it's coming. And what we have to think about today is in 2017, we'll bring three things. We're talking about those over the last few weeks. I'm going to talk about them in two weeks. And there are these opportunity, obstacles, and opposition. We're going to talk about in a couple weeks how to face opposition and how to reach those people. Today, we're going to talk about will I be ready for those things? You see... But you have to measure in your life, what is your bullseye, right? What is the arrow of your life? Shoof, hitting. What is, what's going on? And and our, for for, uh, our purposes today and, and for the purpose of your life, that bullseye should be following and imitating Jesus Christ. 
That should be it. And today you may be a skeptic, you're not a church person, you're not a follower of Christ, and you're like, ah, Steve, you know. And here's what I know. There are a lot of great bullseyes you can have that are not bad. Career, family, education, dating life, pleasure, things that you go after, you work for, you set goals and you try to get those things. There's nothing bad about those things. It's not about what is bad or good. It's about what is best for your life, right? What is best for your life. So what's my bullseye imitating Jesus Christ? Let's go to Hebrews right now. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's talk about what that looks like. Reviewing last week. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off what, guys? Everything. When I get really adamant about a point, I'll go into a little more southern mode. It's not just everything. It's everything. That means, that means you've got to get serious about everything in your life that is going to hinder your focus your bullseye, if you want to hit it, you got to throw it off. Now, here's an interesting addition to that line. And the what? The sin that so easily entangles. So what that tells us right there is there are bad things, evil things that we allow to come in our lives that take our focus away from following Christ. But there are also potentially good things, not bad, evil things that can weigh us down right? That take our focus on Christ, and we're going to take, uh, talk about that in just a minute. And let us run with what? The perseverance, the race marked out for us. I talk about this to young Christians a lot when they're going, how do I read? How do I pray? How do... Listen, God has marked a race out for you. Your race path looks a little different. There, there are similarities and principles, but how often you pray, or when you pray, or what Bible read, what devotional. The deal is run the race in such a way as to win the prize. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to run it with perseverance. What do we do, though? We have to fix our eyes on who? On Jesus. We talked about aiming. Are you aiming with the right eye? Are you aiming at the right target? It has got to be Jesus. I would love to sit here today and say, fix your eyes on Steve Glover, right? But I can tell you over the last seven days, there are some days I would absolutely not want you to have seen Steve Glover. Anybody else with me? Anybody else are glad that the world didn't see some of your actions or thoughts or those kind of things over the last couple of weeks? Now, that's true. But if you fix your eyes on Jesus, see, he has already faced the trials. He's the pioneer. He's blazed the trail. He is the perfecter of our faith. He is the one that says, if you will follow me, if you will look to me first for your issues, your obstacles, I will show you how to overcome them. But Steve, hard-headed Glover, when I come up against an obstacle, a challenge, oftentimes the first person I default to is Steve Glover. Well, how can I fix this? How can I overcome this? And then when I'm laying on the ground, beat up, when my marriage is suffering, when my kids are suffering, when my finances, you know what I mean? Then I go, oftentimes, I'm getting better at not doing this. I go, okay, Jesus, I need you. You know, because we're kind of hard-headed in that way, us control freak types. You see, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, guys. Jesus has gone through the trials, the shame. It talks about scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And here's the, here's the truth of a, a, a group this size. There are people in here, man, you're absolutely already beat down this year. You're like, man, my goals, my, my dreams, my bull, it's just uh, whatever. And God is saying to you today that you don't have to live there. You don't have to live in defeat. Do not lose heart. He says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as what? As his son. Verse 7 says this, endure hardship as discipline. 
God is treating you as his what? Turn to somebody and say, God is a good, good father. For what children are not disciplined by their father? You know, there's a worship course we sing, you're a good, good father. Okay? We don't sing, you're a bad, bad father. It's what you do. You hurt me too. I don't you know. I'd... <laughs> and my kids sing that about me sometimes, right? And it's true sometimes. But God is a good, good father. But how many of us ever, ever, we ever doubt that statement, that God's a good father? Anybody ever doubt that? Even for a nanosecond? Any honest Christians in the house? My Monday started off pretty challenging. And yesterday, we had this great thing called Infuse, which is raising up young uh, worship uh, leaders. We started uh, teaching our teenagers, young teenagers, to uh, play their instruments for Christ. That was a cool thing. Noah headed it up. It, it's just, it was cool to watch. And I had a great morning uh, teaching some music stuff with a team here. And then I went home, and man, I got, I stayed up too late. I uh, got up a little early. And so I'm, I'm going to take a nap. And I'm sitting there and, um, you know, taking a power nap, set my phone. Hey, wake me up. Series really cool. Wake me up at three o'clock. And um, just before it's time to wake up, you know how you're in that afternoon nap and deep, deep sleep, right? It's just, yeah, 50 plus, you love it. Hey, and uh, so it's one of those situations where all of a sudden I hear my bedroom glass sliding door just boom, boom, boom. And as a father and as a husband, you kind of sense something. Anybody with me, parents? And I'm like, shoof, up, out of the dead sleep, kind of disoriented. And I hear Sarah's voice, and Steve, Steve, Steve. And I'm like, uh-oh, one of the kids is hurt. I just know it's this instinct. And I come in to the living room, and, and she's holding our six-year-old Luke, and just blood just gushing out of his head. Now, what you don't know, don't judge me, it could, is, is we, we got a trampoline for Christmas as a safety net. And, uh, you know, and so one of the things is we have some little step stones going to the trampoline. And at one point over the last couple of weeks, I said, we probably need to move this trampoline away from those step stones because the little zip door, the only place you can fall out would be there if, if they left it open and then somebody might fall and hit their head. Guess what? First week of the fast, right before I'm about to come speak, he's coming in and he is just full of blood. And then Sarah, who's not good with blood, I see her, I see her pale and not able to breathe or talk, and she's about to pass out because she, she does that. I'm like, baby, baby, sit down. I don't want another head injury, too. I don't want you know, two ER situations. So we look him over and we're like, we got to take him to the, the ER. And obviously, with a head injury and a lot of blood, you don't know the extent. He's conscious. That's good. You know, there's, there's some practical first aid stuff you look for. But... When those moments come, ready or not, there is a moment, and can I be honest, confession of a pastor, I'm getting my, my shoes on, I'm looking in the mirror of my bathroom mirror, and I say to God, God, don't take my son. You know, I try not to be a worst case scenario guy, and I'm staying calm for my wife and being strong, you know, man. Uh, but in those moments, in that little split second, you start to go, God, would you do this? And, and again, I'm not saying if it had or had not. Thank God he's okay. He got a staple and, and he was tough. It, it, thank God he's okay. But in that moment, when I'm looking at the fatherhood of God, the beautiful thing is because of my preparedness, my relationship with him, that thought goes away. And I have to say, whatever happens, God, to me, to my family, Will I trust you? Will I trust you? Is what I say I believe to hundreds of people every week, guess what? Now, is it true? Right? How many know that's real life right there? Let me just tell you something. God is okay with your doubts. But he wants you to understand at some point, it is a faith choice. That you have to say, God is a good, good father. I will trust him. And I said, God, I trust you. You know, and I prayed the prayer that I think every good dad would pray. And that is, God, don't take Luke. Take me. 
Here's what's cool about that. Jesus says, don't lay their sins on them. Lay their sins on me. That's the beauty of the gospel. And Sarah and I have often said, and listen, if you don't have kids and you're not a parent, do, do not feel condemned by this. But I have to say, having kids, you have a little extra sensory of what it means between the relationship of father and son, God and Jesus. You know what I'm saying right there? You just have this little extra kind of thing. And, and, and here, here's what I know. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. How many are amen to that? Later on, however, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Amen to that. Isn't that awesome? That he, it produces in us and we have to... To, to trust him because the obstacles are coming. But here's what I also know, guys. Obstacles are coming. And listen, obstacles are oftentimes, you need to write this one down because I don't think I have it on your handout. Obstacles are often described, I mean, uh, disguised as opportunities. Opportunities will come, but they're actually distractions or deterrence from your bullseye, Right? Uh, it can be great career things. And you're thinking, man, if I can do this in my career, my family, I'll be a better Christian. And that's not saying it is or is not wrong. But sometimes you find yourself focusing on good things, but it pulls you away from God things. How many of you I'm talking about? That can even be, check it out, Christians, while you're condemning all the evil people in the room about their bad habits and stuff, you can get so religious that you forget it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. We see this in the story of the prodigal son. You have the rebellious son, but then you have the religious son who doesn't get what it means to love that lost person that comes back. He, he's mad at dad. He's saying, dad, you're not a good, good father. Here I have been with you. I'm keeping all the rules. I, I'm giving in the offerings. I'm working hard. I'm doing the Christian thing. But there was no love in his heart for lost people. And I'm going to tell you, that's, you can get so religious, so caught up in your Bible reading and prayer and church attendance, you can forget the bullseye. It's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done, and what he wants to do for lost people as well as your lost butt. Just, just getting real with you. So today, don't let good things get in your way this year. Career is great. Recreation, sports, all the things that I love, they're great. Family, important. You can't neglect your family. Relationships, dating, all those fun things, you're, those are awesome. But they should be on the outer rings of your target. They're a target, but you want them to move toward making me a better Christian and glorifying God. Somebody say amen to that. So what are we going to do last week? We said we are going to turn our oh no, ready or not, into what? Okay, come on. You got to turn your oh no into? You got to be like the Kool-Aid man busting through the wall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Becca Reed, I say, oh, yeah, a lot. She always busts on me about the Kool-Aid man that she sees that picture every time. Busting through. So here it is. When your obstacle comes, you just grab a thing of Kool-Aid, spiritual Kool-Aid. No, you don't do that. That's, that's, a bad, that's a bad example. Forget I said that. Can we delete that out of the stream? Um, but literally, you're ready to go. Oh, yeah. I can take this obstacle. Look at what Booker T. Washington, African-American scientist, in the deep south, in some of the toughest times, success is to be measured. Bullseye. Not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has what? Yesterday morning and so many mornings, some of you know one of our cafe frontlines people, Mary Haney. Mary is full of life. She is, she is here serving. She serves at our one-on-one. She just gives to the church. Just a phenomenal testimony and story. What many of you don't know, unless you have been around a few years, is that Mary at one point, diagnosed with cancer, went through some grueling chemo treatments. And I watched that lady, Mary, and she was sitting here last night, and I knew she wouldn't want me to point her out, but I watched her many days come to this front lines, come and serve on Tuesday mornings, during our staff meetings and help with the admin, come to the one-on-ones, so weak, 
so drained from the front. You know she's, at one point, I, I said, Mary, you, you've got to go home. You, you've got, you cannot do this. And she just has such joy. I'm going to tell you what, I can, it is unbelievable to, unbelievable to me that I get up and preach to hundreds of people each weekend, that our church has a, a couple of thousand people that call it home. It's really, really cool for me personally. But I'm going to tell you what, I have a good feeling that my crown in comparisons to Mary won't even be measurable. Because there is no insignificant part of the body. And oftentimes the people that are enduring behind the scenes without the pomp and the circumstance and the front lines, you know, they're kind of like the offensive lineman of a football team. You see the quarterback, Tom Brady. I, I. Yeah. Yeah. And just for my buddy over here, Aaron Rodgers. Uh. <laughs> but any of us that have played football know if those five big boys up front say, oh no, Brady and Rodgers are going to say, oh no. But when you got that power in front of you, you can say with confidence, I have faith that these guys are going to watch my back, they're going to block for me, they're going to be out in front of me, and this is why they can say, oh yeah, and here's what we face today, guys. You can do this, but we need to realize that there are opportunities in our obstacles, and here's what they are today. Number one, guys, write them down. They sharpen our focus. When you face obstacles in your life, they sharpen our focus. It's actually an oh yeah moment. We, it's a James 1 type thing. You know, the race we run, and I said a little bit about this last week, is not just this easy lane thing. You know, uh, John Maxwell said that any worth, anything worth accomplishing, worth having, is an uphill battle. Not only is it uphill, guys, there are trees and obstacles in the way that you got to dodge. You, you got to watch for them. Because if you don't watch for your obstacles, what's going to happen? You're going to run right smack dab into it. Poof. And how many know if you do that enough, you're going to go, wait a minute. I better look for that obstacle. One of my, you know, I am now gifted with two teenage drivers in my house. I'm, I asked permission to tell this story, even, last night, even though last night I did not because they were not here. But um, so I have got another teenager this year who is eligible for his permit, and how many know, as a teenager, focus is essential? And so when I come out, we've had incidents over the last year and a half since they've started driving with our cars, with repairs, um, and so come out, uh, this is another morning, uh, middle of the week, obstacles coming, get ready or not. Uh, one of my drivers says, oh my gosh, dad. And we see this big poof in the bumper. It wasn't there, obviously, the day before. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm pulling the other driver out to say, uh, hey, you want to come over here? You, did you want to tell me something? And this kind of innocent little smile comes over their face. And well, I figured I would tell you when you asked. And that's Subjective may not be a big deal to dad, may be a big deal to dad. I'll wait and see, okay? So I'm sitting there with, you know, and the, 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 the siblings are going to try to leverage this with dad, right? And so we're sitting there, try, I'm trying to be calm. I have a guest in town with me, staying with me, one of my friends from Colorado. So that kind of diffused the levels, the DB levels a little bit. And so we're sitting there talking about this, and I have to go into dad, listen, okay, uh, this is in a gas parking lot, a gas station. I, I misjudged the turn and the pole. So, so I'm looking at a mark near the center of the bumper. <laughs> going, Okay. So, and listen, 
I only, it's funny because it is Steve Glover at 17, 18, 19 years old all over again. I'm just being honest with you. That's why I have a lot of grace, a lot of mercy. Uh, and so, but I have to go into the good, good father section to talk about the ramifications. If this had been on a highway, if this had been a lapse in judgment or focus in a more uh, serious situation, then people can be hurt. This is very serious. Got to tell that. And you know, don't you love the wisdom and philosophy of teenagers? And the philosophy, with, without hesitation, with all seriousness, with conviction, but dad, I have not had a major accident in months. <laughs> I have not. So to all the parents, and, and, but I knew what they meant. There has not been major damage to a car, thanks the Lord, in months. Uh, but here's the, here's the deal. Hopefully, in the gas station parking lots, now one of my drivers has sharpened their focus on judging the distance of a turning radius and poles. Amen to that? It will sharpen their, and I thank you to my kids for allowing me to share that because they're great kids and I, I had the same kind of stuff when that, I was that age. It sharpens our focus. Number two, guys, I, I already kind of hinted to this. When you have obstacles, they test your truth. It's one thing to say, I am a believer in Christ. I love Jesus. I, I, I am going to follow him. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to witness for him. It's another thing to get out there and live it. How many know what I'm talking about? When somebody talks bad about you, when somebody, someone challenges you with the evolutionary debate and the we've evolved and you see all the scientific evidence for that and you start going, what do I say to that? How do I respond to that? When you see something bad happen... When you lose a loved one and you've been praying for them, when, you, when you're sitting in your marriage and you, you're trying to say, God, how do I do this? And, and it's real. The pain is real. The finance, the checkbook is real. Listen, obstacles will test your truth, right? It will test the fact that are you really loving people? Are you really going to be an authentic, vulnerable person? And today, just as, uh, you know, when, when you have a child who's bleeding and you don't know what's wrong, I'm going to tell you, you learn what you believe real fast. And we're all going to face that. But listen, that is a good thing. That is a good thing for you to go, okay, man, I have some doubts, I have some stuff to deal with. I need, I need to know what I believe in. It will that's your truth. It's kind of like the parable. You know, you often see these people, yeah, Jesus, yeah, small groups, all those kind of things. And then you kind of see them disappear. And I'm not here to condemn them, but you know, there's a parable about seeds that fall on different types of ground. Some of it, you know, it springs up, then it withers away. The weeds choke it out. That's the cares of life, right? Their focus is wrong. They're not as committed as they even think they are or say they are. And today, my prayer for you is to look deeply into your heart. Look deeply into your soul. I'm talking young people, uh, uh, veterans of the faith, and say, what do I really believe in? Am I really committed? Because I'm going to tell you, the time is here and coming where your truth is going to be tested. When people start going, oh, you know the Bible? You believe that in the Bible? And society's saying, Oh, you're a bigot, you, you are a, you a narrow-minded, uh, religious zealot, and you go, uh-oh, your truth will be tested. Your love for people that hate you, I'm, be, I'm being real, I'm trying to get you ready, you'll be tested. You see, they sharpen our focus, they test our truth. Number three, guys, they shape our character. How you respond to an obstacle will either make you a better or a worse person. You're either going to be, yes, I can do this. Thank you, God, for helping me overcome this. Or, man, I cannot believe life and God did this to me. I ain't going to let that happen to me again. I will get the upper hand. You know, you see where I'm going there. They shape our character. Go read James 1. Go read James 1 about how uh, 
welcoming pure joy when trials and tests come our way because it shapes our hope and our patience and our endurance. And that's the deal, man. When you're running a race, when you're working out, when you're disciplining your budget and your finances, when you're saying, I will not have sex before marriage, and it's been a part of your life most of the time, it's going to be really, really hard. But if you can get through it and you go, wow, I went on that date, I was tempted, but I walked away and I let the Holy Spirit give me strength. And you go, I can do this through Christ. I can succeed. I can turn away from that new whatever I want to buy. And I can do good. I can give rather than receive because that's more blessed. Not easy at the time, but however, it produces a harvest of what, guys? Righteousness in your life. And lastly, they sharpen our focus, test our truth, they shape our character. And here's the deal, guys. You can be all that in your life, but when... The poo-poo hits the fan. I'm just being honest. You will be humbled quickly. Guys, everything we as human beings can accomplish. Great careers, great relationships, everything. And listen, those are all important. Education, great friendships, uh, having downtime and a good hobby, good recreation, uh, re- recreational outlet. All those things are important to life. Nothing wrong with those in the right context. But how many know anything man can accomplish can go away? The, uh, the economy, uh, you know, because we live in a fallen world where disease and sin and accidents are real, all because we live in a fallen world, we can lose a loved one, we can lose a family, and that's not because God hates us, but it's just the reality of a broken world we live in. I can't explain everything to you, but at some point you go, that is my where my faith says to me, God, without you, I'm lost. That's, that's what makes me get up today. And when Luke's laying in the bed with us last night, and I see him laying there with his little staple in his head, and he's breathing, he's doing good. And I just go, without the grace of God, he might not be here today, right? So I appreciate that. Every day is a gift. Turn to somebody right now and say, it's a gift to be sitting by you today. It is. It's a gift. Come on, you guys, don't be a religious. I ain't saying nothing. (laughs) Some of you are like, "Mm, I don't know why that face came. So, in the last couple minutes, I want to give you some some of the most important things for 2017. It's not going to (laughs) be earth shattering news. Which, but it is extremely vital to being ready for obstacles. Right here, number one, guys. You know what? I had, at first I had read your Bible. Then I went, that's not, that's not good enough. You need to study the Bible. You know what? You know, there's a difference between reading something and studying it. How many know what I'm talking about? It is better. I would rather you, as a follower of Christ, read less and study more every day. So that you literally ingest it. You don't want it just to go here and go out. You want it to go here down to your heart. You want it to make that long 18-inch journey. You want it to literally be in you. Study the Word of God. Guys, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, this is an important word. What's that word say? All scripture is God-breathed, not man-written. That's a big apologetics debate. And is useful for a lot of things. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and what? In righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly what? Equipped for every good work. How many of us men love our power tools? Come on. Even if you can't use them like me sometimes. Here's the deal, guys. Going out in life without the Word of God is like going to a job site without your equipment. Now think about the job that you're going to try to do tomorrow. You're probably using some kind of equipment. It would be like us trying to do a great worship service without our keyboards, without our sound system, without our lighting. It, we, it would not be Good, and the obstacles would be you couldn't hear. We just wouldn't be able to accomplish 
the task, hit the bullseye. And God's saying to you today, I want uh, to give you the tools, baby. I want to give you the stuff that when the obstacles come and that tree sitting in your path, you just, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I do a weenie chainsaw, don't I? I can't, yeah. The second thing, studying your Bible. Guys, study your Bible. Prayer, bam. Pray every day. Here's the cool thing. James 5, 16. Love this verse. Check this out. Are you ready? Turn to somebody and say, I'm ready for this one. James 5, 16 says, the prayer of a righteous person. Let's stop right there because that's huge. Who in this room is righteous? Okay. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. What does that mean? In your own power, in your own accomplishments, none of us are righteous. How are we made righteous? Through what we do for God? Wrong. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Here's what excites me. Here's where I need a Hammond B3 going, yeah! The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay, prayer is the power. The Word of God is the equipment. Guess what happens when you plug power into the right equipment? If I say, Greg, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and Greg's a friend of mine, and if he's going through a tough time, and I say that, but I'm not really living it, and I'm not really praying it, I'm not really in relationship with God... It can have a good effect, but if I say to Greg, and I look at him in the eye, and I've been praying for him in the fishing ministry, and, and he's coming against obstacles, and I say, Greg, and I'm plugging into the power of what I know God's done in my life, and I pick up my power tool and say, Greg, you can do all things to Christ who strengthens you. Now go win those boys to Christ. How many know something happens in the spiritual realm, stuff falls. Stuff gets out of the way. You be, you're able to stand. And listen, here's the cool thing. It don't matter if you've been a Christian for 100 years or one day. You are made righteous, not through your strength or your maturity or how many scriptures you know. You are made righteous through Jesus. So that means your simple, fumbled, non-eloquent, non-these and thou's prayers are as powerful as God gives anyone. If you tap into the faith that, hey, the scripture says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And God, I believe right now you're going to save my family. You're going to help me in this job situation. You're going to help me to discipline my finances. God, I believe your word, not because of anything I've done, because of what you have done for me. And I want to tell you, that is an awesome combination. But what happens when that really, really big mountain, big obstacle, and here's where we're at for, for this, this month, guys. The overcoming power is God's in prayer, but the overcoming privilege, check it out, is ours. When you think you're overcoming stuff, remember, it's not your power, but it is your privilege. It is going, yay, God, you did it. That is an awesome Awesome quote. Let's look at this next one, guys. When you come to something that is just like a major, major obstacle, here's something we oftentimes don't, don't think about. And this is why we're doing it in our 20 to 1 days, because we know that, it, that obstacles are coming for our church and our families. You need to fast. Here's what Jesus had a situation. Look at this, this situation in Scripture. It says in Mark chapter 9, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately. They're, they're troubled. Why could we not cast it out? See, there was a spirit on this man, an evil spirit, and, and God's doing all these miracles through them. But there's this one situation that, that didn't seem to get better. And they're like, what's up? And so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and what? And fasting. You see, there's a stronghold in this person's life. There's such damage by the evil of this world that we need to put our flesh aside, our doubts aside. We need to say, I will give up this. And listen, 
We all need to do this. The Bible doesn't say if you fast. It says when you fast. Jesus said that. And so we're challenging you this month to say, hey, what can I give up? And we are not asking you to do a a hardcore, no food, 21-day fast. You should not do that unless you've checked with your doctor and you've done a lot of fasting in your lifetime. Don't do that. But you can give up chocolate, sugar, Facebook. You can give up uh, uh, some things that you really crave that are not necessarily that great for you anyway and say, God, I want to trade my desires for your desires. Look at this quote, guys. It says, uh, Jack Haver says, the power of the fast is found in the abject humility of people who desire the Lord's way to focus on him in their lives more than the bread or that thing that you're giving up that sustains their physical bodies. We read our Bible, we pray, We fast. And guys, go to our website. If you have not joined us, go to our website. We've got great material, devotionals every day that will tell you exactly how to do that. And last as we close, guys, and this is Rally Week Sunday. And the last thing we can talk about that's going to help you overcome obstacles is such a cool one. And I love the fact that Deep Creek really tries to model this. And it gets tougher as we get larger, but we do this through life groups. And this is Friendships. Turn to somebody and say, thank you for being my friend. Love that song, old song. One of my favorite things uh, as I've gotten older about ESPN, because I'm really used to be a big sports junkie, but I still love sports, is ESPN tells great human interest stories. They, they, and so I'm watching this story the other day on, on YouTube, and I... I I just called the story the Cleveland Boys because they were from inner city, urban Cleveland, Ohio. So you meet this one young uh, high school young man who at the age of probably 10 or 11, I think it was, he's walking down the train tracks of a very busy station. And you guys that have lived in inner cities know, you know, all the spaghetti of the freight areas, slow moving freight trains kind of going in and out of the station. So he's just fooling around. He's got his backpack. He's going to school. He's walking on the tracks. He's kind of flirting with the train, right? The train's coming real slow. And so he's going to jump off the track at the last minute. And when he jumps off the track, his pants legs gets hung in one of the rails. And he falls and he can't get free. That train caught him and drug him down the tracks and took both of his legs. One, he had a nub just, another, uh, just above the knee. The other was completely up. So his life, now you're talking about not just a kid in the inner cities with not much chance, African-American kid, but now a kid who's crippled and disabled pretty badly. So fast forward a few years in high school, and they, they show this scene, this kid who was crippled in a wheelchair, and they show him coming up, backing up to his house in the inner cities, no wheelchair ramp, no, I mean, pretty, pretty, meager living he would back up to the ramp and he by this time he's pretty muscular and he gets out of his chair and gets on the ground he flips his chair over his head past the three steps flips it on the uh the porch goes up those stairs and hops up in that wheelchair and goes in his house but then you see a scene where he's coming into the high school gym and there's this other big uh uh, african-american kid carrying him on his back He has befriended this guy who made a commitment to carry him everywhere he goes in school. Every time he, and he's learned to wrestle, and every time he goes out on the mat, this buddy carries him out, puts him on the mat, and they're the best of friends. But that's not the end of the story. Here's what was amazing. See, what you don't know about this other big, strong African-American wrestler is the kid that's carrying him is legally blind. You have a kid with his legs cut off. If somebody said, I will be your legs. You have a kid with his eyes, he can't see a foot in front of him. And the guy with no legs says, I will be your eyes. See, that's the beauty of the family of God. It was this amazing story about how this little petite white woman from ESPN, (laughs) producer, she said, you know, a lot of times we do these stories on these kids and we leave and we never really think about them again. 
She was honest. You know, they, she said they don't have much of a chance, not going to make it to college. She got interested, long story short. The kid with no legs is now a computer designer, graphics, video game guy because she helped him get into college, get a scholarship. The kid that was blind because he really was not able to get into college and other things and wasn't good enough to be uh, a, a, a wrestler in the major college ranks. But she did help him get into and introduce him to the Paralympics for disabled athletes. And here's the deal. He learned judo because of his wrestling background and made it to the American Paralympics team and then was up for a medal. And she flew the friend with no legs all the way, I believe it was in London and Europe, to watch him wrestle, I mean to do the judo. He ended up winning a bronze medal. But to see those guys together again, to see a friendship, that was amazing. It's such a beautiful picture to me of the body of Christ. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, the one may be overpowered. Guys, there are obstacles that are going to be too much for us. Here's what God tells us. Two can defend themselves. A cord of three, guess what? It's not easily broken. And I can tell you there have been many times in the history of our church where my friends, my family, many of you sitting in here today, when I couldn't go on, you literally put me on your back. You said, come on, Steve. Through prayer, through encouraging words, you were strength for me. You were Jesus for me. And when we join life groups, guys, that's what we're trying to do. Not to be something inauthentic or, I don't know, ultra-religious. We just want to be followers of Christ who go through real struggles, real obstacles that are growing and getting stronger together with Jesus Christ. And I encourage you today, man, if you don't have a circle, what are you doing? You need a circle of friends. You need those relationships. And if you can't find it at Deep Creek, find it somewhere, man. That's so important to your walk with Christ. Let's pray today. Father, I thank you that today, Jesus, you didn't come to condemn the world and tell us, I can't believe you, quote, unquote, wrecked the car or made that mistake. or You didn't come to beat us up. You came to lift us up came to take our sin and our mistakes and our sorrows every day and the cross has the final word and it says we are made righteous through your blood through your forgiveness and today if you're here and you don't know Jesus guys right where you sit you can say Jesus I need you Father I need you trust him put your faith in him give your sin to him Give your life to him, and he will give you a new life. The Bible says you'll be born again in your spirit. And all you got to do right now where you sit is pray, Jesus, I need you. I, I encourage you, if the spirit of God is drawing you, respond and say yes. Say yes, Jesus. I want to know you. I want to be planted in you. I want to be committed to you. I want you to be my bullseye of life. We at this church will help you walk that walk. We will become your friends to help guide you. And God, for those of us today that are going through obstacles and pain and suffering and our humanness, God, teach us to read and study your word, to pray, to fast, and to carefully choose our friends, as Proverbs says, so that we may hit the bullseye, and that's being a follower of Christ. Thank you for this opportunity. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen. I love you guys. Thank you for being here today.